I took every bill in my life and then I paired a property with it. Buy a property to match a bill, buy a property to match a bill until all my bills were covered. Property values go up, my rental income goes up, the expenses go down, the mortgages get paid off. So I actually live larger and larger in retirement. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. Well, uh, welcome to another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Alan Corey. And so, um, Alan, I've been chasing you down for a couple years now. Not that you're hard to get a hold of, but mostly I was uh, a little bit chicken to actually get this this whole thing going. So I really appreciate you. Oh, well, us. that's awesome. Well, I, 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 if I would have known, I would have made it an easier process for you, but I, I always encourage people reaching out, uh, meet, uh, meet, meet new people anytime. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, – what, what was great is when I first reached out to you, you responded right away, and you were definitely like ready and available back then. So, um, yeah, really appreciate you. And, and with that being said, you know, please uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe some – about your background, where and how you found success as you define it. And uh, please include something interesting, you know, most people wouldn't know about you. Yeah, sure. I've been a real estate investor for over 20 years. I started in the projects of Spanish Harlem uh, with $10,000, and now I've turned it into a 350-door portfolio. And um, it it took some risk, and it took some dedication and effort. Um, along the way, I've had previous careers and identities as a stand-up comedian and a reality TV uh, I, I hate to use the word star, but uh, it, it's um, I've, I've been on six or seven reality TV shows at least you know, 15, 20 years ago when I wanted to be a comedian. And um, uh, it doesn't pay well. So I was like, well, you know, if I, I, I get enough rental income, then I could folk, you know, prioritize this this career. And then I realized my dream turned into just buying more real estate. I, I enjoyed that more. I was better at it and it paid much uh, better as well. So I, I went all in on real estate and abandoned the, the comedy career. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sort of a secret uh, or in the closet, like a comedian, right? Like I, I would, I would, I would love to have a stand up um, comedy, uh, you know, career, but um, yeah, that just seems like an incredibly tough road to hoe. So um, I, I love that though. So did you, had you done, did the, did you do that for a couple, quite a few years, have quite a few shows? and Yeah, I, I was in uh, New York City, and I, I spent every single night in the comedy clubs, which is really my catalyst for real estate investing because I was nine to five at a day job. I was working a tech support job. Then I was in the comedy clubs till three o'clock in the morning and uh, you know performing two or three times a night. And then I was like, this is unsustainable. I'm bad at both my day job and, and comedy. So that's when I started diving digesting and devouring everything I could real estate relating and set a plan for myself that I was going to buy one property a year until I could leave my day job. And then I just got a, an addiction to real estate. You got the real estate bug. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you do, you know, uh, which everyone does, well, you know, you, you do it long enough. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, and, uh, so, so great. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, please, Please share with us one or more of your favorite successes that either you solely created or, or were a part of. Yeah, well, so my original dream and and, and what wasn't actually to be a stand-up comedian. My my dream was to 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 be a writer. I wanted to write. I, I enjoy writing. And I enjoyed writing jokes. I enjoyed um, just just I looked at myself as a writer, and I wanted to be a comedy writer. And I talked to stand-up comedians that were coming through town in Atlanta, where I was living at the time. And they said, you got to move to New York City and be a stand-up. And people then will hire you to write. And I was like, okay. Um, you know, I don't usually say take recommendation, you know, career advice from stand-up comedians. But I did and moved to New York. And and I was like, okay, well, this is how I'm going to get my job as a writer. And then what I realized is, as I was doing comedy and and – reading real estate books was that, man, every single book is boring and it's textbook. And, you know, why can't anyone make a funny real estate book? And so that became my goal was, you know, okay, 
if I have enough real estate experience, then I'll get a book deal and I can write an entertaining and fun guide to personal finance or career, or real estate investing, uh, which was all those things I was into. And so to me, that was really the, the driving factor is, is I wanted to be paid to be a writer. And, and so that's what it led to. And now I've got three books under my belt and I try to create entertaining real estate and career content um, and and grow how to grow money and, and put it in a fun way, which I'll tell you, I know now why it doesn't exist. It's really hard to do. Really? It, it, yeah, I, I would imagine so. I'd never thought of that. But I will say, uh, like I was telling you before we press record on this uh, show here, I did read House Fire, and that's exactly what that is. It's a very entertaining and very informative book. And um, speaking from experience is, is the way that you wrote it, right? And you spoke a bit about you know your success there. Um, and so, yeah, I highly recommend that book. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your uh, other two? Are they sort of like in, in a familiar or similar format as far as being entertaining? Uh, yeah, and they're all first person accounts mostly. Uh, the first one uh, was called A Million Bucks by 30 about how I became a millionaire before 30. So that, that was obviously a very big goal, a uh, success goal that I had. Uh, and then um, the second one was called The Subversive Job Search. And so this is this was came out right after the great financial you know crash and i had to reinvent myself as a corporate nine to five guy there, there was just no one was lending on real estate deals and so um it's how i created a six-figure career from scratch c-suite level um and three years i basically reverse engineered a lot of job postings and, and found ways to you know subversively find my way to the top. And so I teach those, those strategies, how to negotiate, how to job hop, when to job hop, things like that. And then, so that was a subversive job search. And then the third one, which you mentioned was house fire. Fire stands for financial independence, retire early. And it's sort of my fire plan to, um, retire. And so what I did is I took every bill in my life and then I paired up property with it. So I, I didn't like my $150 utility bill that I can't get rid of. I can't play in bulk, you know, buy in bulk, but math said I needed to save up a hundred thousand dollars and withdraw 4% of that every single year. But really with twenty two thirty thousand dollars $30,000, I could buy use a down payment on a property that would cash flow 150 bucks that would pay that bill. And so I would just save you know, $20,000 chunks, buy a property to match a bill, buy a property, to match a bill until all my bills were covered. And then I retired that way. And why I like that investment plan over than any others is I'm not living on a constrained budget because every other retirement plan, you have a pension or you can only withdraw 4% and you have a constrained budget. But with property, the property values go up. My rental income goes up. You know, expenses go down. The mortgages get paid off. I can charge a little bit higher in rent. So I actually live larger and larger in retirement. Uh, and so that's sort of the book was to teach others how to do it as well. Yeah, because you want to add another, you know, toy in your garage, right? You just find another investment property that covers that payment, right? Yeah, like, like I, I want to buy a Tesla. I don't need a Tesla, but I want to buy a Tesla. So I, I can either give, you know, $50,000 to the richest man in the world and say, here, give me in exchange a Tesla. I, I don't want to do that. He, he doesn't need that. So instead, I will take $50,000, keep it by buying a property, an asset that has my name on it. I own that $50,000. And then that is, property is going to cash flow enough to cover my Tesla car note for seven years until my Tesla is paid off. And then when that Tesla is paid off, um, then I've got an extra $350 to earmark to another toy or another, you know, vacation budget or, or something like that. And the appreciation in the property. Cause you said, you know, keep the $50,000. Not only that, it's growing it. Right. So yeah, yeah, right, right. That $50,000 is going to, you know, stay with me. It turns into a hundred thousand dollars. Elon Musk still happy. He got his $50,000 over a seven year period. So we all win. So that's, that's, that's the way I sort of approach everything is what's expense in my life or what do I want to do? What, you know, I want to spend three months in Hawaii this summer. What, how much is that going to cost? Okay. I need to go buy a property that's going to pay for my Hawaii fund. And, you know, it, once you sort of cover all your bills, it, it gets fun to just like invent new things that you want to pay for. Yeah, no, I can see that uh, happening for sure. Um, what would you say is one of the most valuable uh, lessons you learned from, re, you know, finding retirement this way, the FIRE method? I mean, I, Yours me, in particular. It, it, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think for all my goals in general, it, it's having a very, very clear focus and, and saying, you know, what am I trying to accomplish? Um, because that makes every decision easy. Um, because... 
if, if, if it's like, I want I, I hate my student loan bill, right? Or whatever it is. Like, I just want a property to cover it. Then that narrows my focus. It, it, it's laser focus. And I'm just looking at properties. Is it 200 bucks a month you know, or 250? It doesn't matter. The first one I find that will cover that, I'm going to go ahead and buy. It's not... Let me spend three months looking for the absolute best property with this money that maybe makes an extra 25 bucks or maybe an extra 30 bucks. It's, hey, it, it solves the problem. Let me buy this property. It solves this problem. And then once that's solved, I can start focusing on the next bill or the next problem. So it, um, it really takes away the analysis paralysis that a lot of people have um, when it comes to real estate or they're, you know, they're looking at a short-term rental versus a long-term rental or, you know, out of state or local. And it's just like, hey, wh wh which one gets the job done? Solved it. Okay, buy it. Move on to the next bill. And so it's just that that having that focus and, and pulling the trigger as soon as you solve that problem, um, uh, it, it leads to growth and it takes a lot of the stress out of it, honestly. Yeah. I, lo I love that philosophy because, um, for a few reasons, but you know, when you said it, it handles an analysis paralysis, but also once you find the property that takes care of that, you know, problem, um, and you take action on that, you're going to get it to where it's covering your bill much faster than if you had to analyze, you know, 50 properties, you want to create an extra $50 or $100, um, you know, cash flow, how much money did you lose, lose in that time, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the waiting and trying to find the best deal or, or all that is, is you're losing money and, and adding stress and you're still paying the bill that you're trying to cover. So yeah, go just just pull the trigger as soon as you can. Um, you know, a lot of people try to time the market. Let's wait for the interest rates to be better. And to me, interest rates don't matter what doesn't make a deal good or bad. I've, I found terrible deals that even if I had a 0% interest rate, I would never buy. And I found great deals that even with a 15% interest rate, I would still buy. So interest rates are just a variable. And, you know, the way I look at it is if it makes money, Today, it covers, it solves my problem with today's interest rate, and it's a, I get a 30-year fix. I, I can either stay that way and be fine. That bill's always covered. Or if the interest rates go down, I can refinance, and I, I'm, I win, right? So it, it, to me, it's just always be buying. Yeah, it's a, it's almost like a good thing uh, in that you know scenario if you have a high interest rate, right? Because it's most likely you're going to be able to refi and bring it down. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And I love buying properties with high interest rates because – what happens also is if interest rates lower, it makes the property value go up, right? So I'm building equity if the interest rates drop, you know? So it, it's, it's a double, you know, double-ended, you know, kind of whammy, but a good whammy in that, yeah, I get a lower interest rate, but also my property value goes up because interest rates, you know, put, push values up and, and it, 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 it's a great win. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And when interest rates are high, do you ever, you know, are, partake in uh, creative financing, owner financing, subject to mortgage wrap, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I've, I've bought over 30, 40 properties with seller financing. Um, and so um, it it's one of those things where I, I bought the retiring guy's portfolio and they were, you know, uh, it started with a 30 home portfolio and he couldn't sell it. Uh, couldn't get financing on a lot of these were in rough shape, delayed maintenance. Um, and he, he had it for sale for, I want to say nine months. And I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, I'll buy it. I can't get financing for this. Um, would you do seller financing? And he's like, sure. So, um, and then what happened is then he's told all of his friends who are also retiring. And then they called me and, uh, and then some of these I bought started, then I started buying their retiring portfolios and they're, they were like $0 down. Like they were just done managing it. They didn't want to do anything with it. And me getting a 15 year note or a 30 year note at 7% interest with 0% down the property still cash flow. They still got enough, you know, more or less the cash flow that they were getting. And so it was a win-win. I just acquired all these properties. And uh, um, then I was 100% passive to, for them. Yeah, 100% yeah, passive for them. And there was built-in property management. I got, you know, I got a local guy. So it was, became passive for me. And I, I packaged them. And I was, two years later, able to sell them to someone who could get financing. Um, and they all doubled in price. So I, I got 50 properties that doubled in price and two and a half years. And I got some cash flow along the way too. So um, it was just one of those things, asking the right questions and, and meeting the right people, really understanding their pain point and, and getting creative with, through financing to solve that pain point.
That's cool. So much fun. And I, you know, honestly could dig into that for another 45 minutes because selfishly I have a lot of questions about going that route. But I always, when I look at a property or I just called somebody yesterday and, you know, if I've got a question on the property's price or whatever, I will always ask them if they're willing to own or finance. And it's like pretty much 90% of the time they are willing, but it depends, it just depends on the terms work for them, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. And um, I, I love it because then it doesn't go against your DTI. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't show up on your credit score. So if you are pursuing other deals traditionally, it's it's all this other, you know, creative finance stuff is no one knows about, you know, and, and so it, it, it helps, you know, grow your portfolio that way too. Got it. Got to love uh, capitalism. It's cool. <laughs> um, would you mind telling us, you know, some of the more incredibly difficult experiences that you've walked through, maybe just even one, and what you learned from it or them? Yeah, I mean, I think what I what I really wish I had um, was a mentor or maybe even a mastermind group. Like when, when I'm 45 and I bought my first property at 21. So back when I was 20, I no no 21 year old knows what they're doing in real estate. Investing. Like I I thought I knew what I was doing, but I, I'll tell you now I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right, but I, I I knew no one who was doing real estate. All I knew were comedians and um and so and my mentor and my guides were were books. And so I was just reading books and like has anyone ever had this problem? So I was learning a lot on the fly, and you know. It, it was tough. It was tough because I was making it up as I go a lot of times or, or, you know, creating my own, digging my own hole and then trying to get out of it, whether it's, you know, a poorly written lease or, you know, how to handle late rent. And, and I, it was just a le constant learning experience. So um, that to me is, is, it, it, I love today's environment where you have podcasts like this, you have uh, networking groups where we've met and you have um, YouTube videos and podcast, like all this stuff that didn't exist back then. And I could actually, you know, tweet someone who has a property uh, investor in my hometown and ask them a question or will you meet for coffee? Like I had no idea who was investing or even how to get in touch with them. So uh, there's all these tools here that can really, really help set you up for success. Use them, right? Uh, just use them, take the online courses, whatever it is that, um, this is this is great that education there that mentorship there that um you know someone to bounce ideas off of or at least hold you accountable or keep you motivated whatever you need this is uh this is a great time to to really kind of learn the the gentle art of real estate investing yeah, yeah, I I love that. You know, and it's it's so true. I'm I'm similar age to you, 47, and so yes, back in the 90s, this this was not uh, what it is today. The information age is so valuable. You can get so much. You can get a a, a a amazing education totally for free, right? YouTube University, for example, or podcasts, or even dirt cheap books, right? Books are amazing um, resource, and uh, so I'm definitely going to be reading your other two books, and uh, I need to go back through uh, House Fire as well. Now, uh, this is a fun question. So I just want to kind of shift gears a little bit here and, and ask you, uh, you know, if you were to be sent back in time with what you know now to age 18, uh, you know, how would you fast track your success as, again, as you define it? Yeah, so honestly, it would probably be same steps. So I turned $10,000 yeah, into a million dollars in six years. And and so that that's that's what a million bucks by 30, that book's about. Um, but it, it comes down to the principles today that, that is taught everywhere. And that's house hacking a multifamily. Um, there wasn't a term for it back then. And I just sort of stumbled upon it because I was in Brooklyn, New York and properties happened to be multifamily. And um, I, I had knew a bunch of comedians who needed a place to rent. So, you know, I invested in a duplex that had three bedrooms on each side. We created the house of clowns, so, you know, six, six uh, you know, I, was, I lived in the smallest room with no windows and no closet and then uh, rented out the five other rooms. And this changed my life because that, that was enough to actually make me exit my day job. It covered all my living expenses, like 1500 bucks extra on top of that. So it, 1500 bucks a month goes a long way. If you don't have any living expenses, it was, it was just going to food and transportation and entertainment, right? That's, um, and, and so I was, that's where I fell in love. I got that addiction of let's buy more, but I was able to buy more because I was able to save so much that, uh, because I didn't have any living expenses. So, uh, most people spend a third to 50% of their take home pay 
to housing, but imagine if you can get rid of that. You can build up a nest egg real quick to buy more and more real estate. So I did that. I also lived off um, a lot of ramen noodles at the time, you know, short-term sacrifices, uh, every meal. I, I would buy my ramen noodles in bulk, so there'd be 13 cents each. I ate that for lunch every day, and, and you know... Uh, I lived way below my means, and and I, you know, I'm, I, I want to be honest. Like you have to make sacrifices to have big effects, right? A lot of people might be hearing this, like I don't want. I, I, there's no way I, I'd eat ramen noodles every day for for a year or two years. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You're you're comfortable, but you're not going to those small sacrifices. In my head, I was like, man, if I just do this in my twenties. I can't imagine, like, I'm going to set up myself for 30s. And and it, I was right. And if you set yourself up uh, with compounding, you know, interest and all this sort of stuff, my, your 40s looks really good. And now, I mean, now I'm like, my man, my 50s are going to be even ama- more amazing. Uh, and, you know, my life gets better and better in retirement because I, I made those sacrifices you know, over a six-year period that um, some people aren't. And and I never felt like I missed out because a lot of people don't want to make those um, sacrifices because like, oh, the 20s are your time to date and to, uh, you know, go do things. And I'm like, yeah, I did that. I was still dating, you know, and, you know, my entertainment was going to comedy clubs. You know, most times I was performing, but also I would hang out and watch. But, um, you know, I... I went to parties and I, I, you know, I did everything everyone else was doing. If I went to the same bars, I just wasn't buying shot after shot. I would, you know, go to the bodega and, and down a, you know, a tall boy before I walk into the bar or something to just save some money. I, uh, yeah, I would take a bus instead of a taxi, like th- those sort of, but I had a vision and it came back to just that clear focus, like everything is this going to make me a millionaire before 30? Is this, am I going to make a million bucks by 30 if I do X or Y? Which one? And it it just made the decision so easy. Like, oh, yeah, ramen today instead of Uber Eats or whatever it is. Like, it's um, it, all those small things add up. And the reason I had to live below my means is because I didn't have a big income. I, at my tech support job, I was making $50,000 a year. So I needed to just cut all of my expenses because – I, all I said is whatever I have in my savings account every January 1st, that is my down payment for a property. So every January 1st, I would check what's in my savings. Oh, I got 10,000. Okay. I can go buy a hundred thousand dollar property. Oh, next year I got 15,000, 20,000. Okay. I can buy a $200,000 property. And I just, just did that over. I did that for five straight years, got five properties. And this is when no one wanted to invest in Brooklyn, uh, or, or New York city is right after nine 11. Everyone's like, this is the dumbest time to buy real estate, Alan. Uh, and I got lucky on an appreciation, but I bought for the cash flow. And even if it never appreciated, I, I would have been great with the cash flow. And if, if you buy for basic fundamentals that this cash flows and this pays a bill, you're, you you can't go wrong. Yeah, I think it's so interesting, uh, Ellen, because there's so many similarities between uh, you and I, right? Um and my first um, property I just bought a couple of years ago was ten thousand dollars, and there's a unique situation right now where I'm actually renting it out for a thousand dollars. I believe I could actually get two thousand dollars a month for that, just because of what's going on. Which is so that's super awesome. Uh, but the house, it is definitely not something that's going to appreciate rapidly, right? But yeah. I also I, I moved to Lake Tahoe when I was like nineteen, and there was seven of us in a house in a dog. And um, just save money, right? And um, just different things. I was in the clubs a lot because I was a musician. So uh, there is so much fun to be had right there. But I also realized, look, if I want to become a career musician or do, do I don't want to be on the road. Uh, you know, d- doing 270 shows uh, per year kind of thing. It's a, you know, kind of different realizations at different points in life. Um, you know, but I think that because you were able to um, sort of leave your W-2, not sort of, but clearly leave your W-2 at an early age, you know, you experienced amazing freedom that a lot of other people were not, right? So there's pros and cons. And I, I wanted to say, yeah, maybe this is a good question for everybody out there listening is like, what is your ramen? Maybe you don't want to give up, you know, your awesome lunches. Maybe there's something else that you can give up. You can go through your subscriptions. A lot of us are just unaware of, you know, probably a solid 50 to a hundred dollars uh, of subscriptions that we have monthly that we don't even really need that much. Right. So what is your ramen? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I only eat ramen if, if, unless it's $16 or more right now, but uh, you know, it, it, it's, to me, it's all about, I was, what gift can I give myself in 10 years? Like, you know, 
Alan, you're eating ramen every day for, you know, for, 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 for two years, three years, the gift I'm going to give myself in 10 years, I can eat $16 ramen. Right. So that, that's, that to me was the way I looked at it is, Hey, I, I'll eat the crappy stuff now, but I want to eat the good stuff in the future. And it's just, let's, let's just pay my dues. And that's the time to do it when you're young. You have very little responsibility financially and otherwise. You don't have a family. That's the time to do it. But even if you do have a family, you still can pull this off. So um, it's it, to, to me, this conversation is really reminding me a lot of your book, House Fire. So I do want to recommend to the audience, um, go get a copy of that book, uh, listen to it or read it. Um, and so, so that, that's awesome. It is a great book, Alan. And let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on mindset and how to go from a non-success mindset or a scarcity mindset to a success mindset or abundance mindset? Yeah, that was hard uh, for me. And what I learned late in life is that, um, I thought, I guess I just didn't believe in myself that I could make more money. Like I, at least at my job at tech support, I just wasn't interested in computers. It just happened to be a job that I got. And I was like, I, I didn't see a career path. I wasn't one who's was going to stay late at work or get whatever certificates to grow my tech support job. Uh, and so um, I, I, I thought I could only cut expenses. But now what I realized was, man, you, if you're cutting expenses, there's, there's a literal floor. Like you can only cut your expenses so much, right? Because you're still going to have to buy some sort of food or tr have some sort of transportation, have some sort of entertainment, right? If you look at the other way, income is they're, they're, the sky's the limit. Like, like there is no limit to the income that you can bring in if you have the right skill set, right? If you have the right mindset. So um, what I realized and what I pivoted to is uh, I became a realtor and that I love real estate. I'm passionate in real estate. Everyone knew I was the real estate guy and they would come talk to me about real estate because I was already doing it on the side. And that that changed my life because then I had an uncapped income. I could, it, I could do as much as I wanted. And then I was like, Oh, I don't need to w really spend any time worrying about cutting expenses because I, 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 I have, I've done that. Right. Like spending an hour to try to figure out how to save 20 bucks out of my, whatever subscription I have or whatever it is, man, I could make 50 bucks an hour doing cold calls or, or whatever. And so it's just that, that light switch that, Hey, maybe in your job right now, you can't control your income. Then you got to find something you can, like maybe pivot into sales or pivot into a, another income stream. Maybe you can have an online business or you flip something on eBay or, or sell something that, that as a passive income, as much as you can to create additional income streams. Th that to me is where you should put your focus in because that's going to be more rewarding. It's going to be more fun, more interesting, and it's going to be more profitable as well. I love that. And we're kind of, uh, you, or you kind of are touching on all, also two different um, philosophies, like one Dave Ramsey, that kind of what you did in, in initially getting rid of your um, debt, right? And sort of thing. Um, and then Robert Kiyosaki, where having other people pay for your assets and the sky is the limit, right? And so um, I, I think that's great advice. I, I, actually, I, I forget, did you go into your three books on the show or was that before? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we did that. We did that. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, well, let's, uh, what, let me ask you this. What would you say is your favorite book of the three? Uh, I, I think the most recent one's probably House Fire. Uh, just, just it's, it's more relevant and, and current and, and, and it's, you know, you can apply it right away. And, and it, I think it, it gives you that vision, that decision thing. So to me, that's, that's the one that's uh, usually my go-to um, uh, to, cause and it's also all about real estate. So my other ones uh, have some personal finance and career advice mixed in, but this one house fire is strictly uh, real estate related. And um, it's, and you mentioned Dave Ramsey. It, I'll, I'll say it right now. This book is anti Dave Ramsey. You know, it, it's, it's about getting into debt because the more debt you have, I, I look at it as you're buying assets that pay for all these bills. Like that's a good thing. Also, I look at it that I'm creating a mutual fund of real estate holdings. So, you know, if I have one property in all cash and it's vacant, I still pay property taxes and insurance. But if I have five properties and one of them is vacant, I'm, I'm, I'm still cash flowing. Like the other four are going to carry that fifth one while it's down. So the more properties you have, I'm actually reducing risk. And um, I'd rather have, you know, $20,000 in five different properties than $100,000 in one where I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. 
Yeah, because you could have 10 doors, right? And then, uh, you know, if you have one vacancy, you're not really going to feel it. But if you had one door, you're really going to feel that if it's yeah. a vacancy. You become desperate. Yeah, exactly. You're going to uh, lower your standards to find a tenant and, and you know, then things go south quickly that way. Yeah. Is there a app, app or some any tech recommendation that you could, uh, you, you know, that you use, you, you find great value in? Uh, to me, it, it's... You networking is key in, in real estate investing and in, in that you you want to talk to other investors but because now the best deals I've ever had are organic deals that found me. And it's all through networking, talking to other investors. Oh, Alan buys this type of property. You should call him. Or, you know, I don't know who to who would do this, but Alan would. And um, so I've become sort of the networker. And so all the deals sort of flow through me before I see them on the MLS or whatever, because everyone knows that, oh, Alan will have an answer for this, or Alan will be interested in buying this. And so that to me is, has been huge. I found a lot of success on Twitter. Um, I, I tweet right now at Real Estate Maxi on Twitter uh, and uh, just connecting with investors all over the world, um, but even local investors. And, and, you know, if you're not on social media, go to local meetups, uh, but you know, reach out to the people who you listen to on podcasts, follow them on you know, LinkedIn or Instagram, whatever, and, and just start networking. Uh, to me, that's huge. And again, that's another tool that didn't exist when we, when I started that, uh, I'm jealous of that, you know, everyone now can, can use this. So I wouldn't say it's just one technology. It's just the technology of social media. I love, you don't have to be creating content. You just consume content of people you, you want to hang with, start commenting on their content and, uh, supporting them. And, and then you'll, you'll start, you know, once you hang around with a few real estate investors or you're consuming real estate investing content every single day, you're going to turn into a successful real estate investor yourself eventually. Yeah, I love it. Stick with it, right? Well, as we're about to wrap this up, again, thank you so much, Alan, for your time. Um, how can our audience support you? Is there any type of deal they can send your way? Um, and how can our audience connect you and, and follow you? What are the best ways to do that? So my biggest thing right now is I do a weekly newsletter called the House Money Newsletter. It's a weekly actionable packed real estate based newsletter. So um, subscribe at realestatemaxi.com and uh, just it's free and it, I, 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 that, that's my big thing right now. And so, uh, that's what I would do. <laughs> um, I also have a podcast, uh, called real estate maximalist. Uh, if you want to check that one out as well, it's a house money, uh, newsletter, uh, version, uh, and a podcast as well. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, well, again, thank you so much, Alan, for joining us today on the gentle art of crushing it. Um, and, um, and unless you have anything else to add here, I will go ahead and uh, sign us out. Doug, this has been great. I appreciate that we've been able to connect and, and have a chat today. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, sir. And, and thank you to all of your listeners. I hope that you are having an amazing day. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the gentle art of crushing it. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.